uh, excited to get started here. Uh, yeah, SCORE is amazing, by the way, I just have to say. I am a SCORE client, I volunteer for SCORE as much as I possibly can, and it's just been immensely helpful. So I'm very thankful for SCORE. All right. Um, can you guys see my screen, Abby and Ray? Looks good. All right, let's get started. So as we dive in here, I just want to let you know, this is a one of the broader topics I've presented on, so we're going to go pretty quickly. But if you have questions, just drop them in the chat. Um, Abby has volunteered to interrupt me and cover those as we go. So if something pops to your mind, just ask it in chat. But just a little bit of a, uh, just a, a note, we're going to move pretty quickly through a lot of big concepts. So the first thing that we're going to talk about is just what is SEO? Uh, there's a good chance a lot of you know uh, what it is, but just to make sure we're all on the same level playing field, I'm going to talk a little bit about it. So this is a, a graphic from SEM Rush, which I think describes it quite nicely. Um, the what of SEO is we're talking about a set of processes aimed at improving your website's ranking in search engines. So Google, Bing, et cetera. How do you get your ranking when someone searches for the service you provide, your name, et cetera? The why is just to get more search traffic to your website. That sounds basic, but it's somewhat important. Um, we can't just focus on vanity metrics. At the end of the day, successful SEO is going to bring more people to your website and then grow your business uh, directly. Um, so that has to be the end goal of everything we do. And then the how, the rest of this presentation is really going to cover the how, but the how they have here at a top level is um, fulfilling users' needs in terms of uh, being relevant, having good quality content, and creating amazing user experiences or customer experiences. Um, this is my own sort of summary of SEO. You might hear that Google has thousands and thousands of different um, factors in their algorithm, different ranking factors. It chooses which website ranks above another. And that is true. But of all those thousands, um, especially for local businesses, they uh, can pretty be it can pretty easily be lumped into one of four buckets. So website performance, the speed of your website, um, the quality of code, those types of things, which we're going to talk about in a minute, the content on your website, um, how you know strong and helpful is your content, links on your links back to your website, so other websites, authoritative websites like chambers of commerce and um, you know local periodicals, things like that that would link back to your website. And then reviews. Reviews, as I have isolated here, are specifically helpful for local businesses. They do help e-commerce other businesses, but if you want to rank locally for when someone searches like plumber near me or bank near me or accountant near me, any of those kinds of things, reviews become especially important. So if you can focus on a high-performing website that has great content that is linked to from other respected organizations and periodicals, and you have a solid number of reviews from customers on Google, uh, you're good to go. All right, so there are two updates last year in Google that I want to bring you up to speed on. If you follow SEO at all, you know that Google is known for continually updating and tweaking different uh, elements of their algorithm. And there's two of those that came out within the last year that I think it's really important for you to know about. The one is the helpful content update. So you can see here, this is right from Google. Um, and they say, what is helpful content? According to Google, it aims to better reward a content where visitors feel like they've had a satisfying experience. So from Google's end, they're trying with their machine learning tools and their AI tools to look at your content and make sure that it's helpful. That usually means the content is unique. It's unique to you. It hasn't been in other places on the web. Um, it's not fluff content. And we're going to talk a little bit about AI. Um, this is where AI and things like that can get, get in trouble. Like it's actually really good, solid content, written content or video content that you've created to help your customers. Um, and it goes into enough detail to explain, explain the concept. So um, this year, Google released helpful content. A lot of people saw that as their kind of answer to AI-generated content, which again, we'll mention briefly, um, but it's important to know that this update came out this year, specifically looking at how helpful your content is. And one last thing I'll say about this, it affects your whole site. So if you've been like, not that you would have, any of you would have, but if you've been pushing out like really fluff content or just like popping out a lot of AI blog posts or something, um, if Google catches with you, catches you with that, the idea is that even if you have 10 just, you know, really weak, uh, unhelpful posts, it can negatively affect the rest of the site too. Um, the next thing is EEAT. -E so Google's been pushing what they called EAT, like EAT, for a while. And this year they added a new one called Experience. So essentially what we have here is Google's trying to understand when someone creates a piece of content. This started with the medical and um, <clears throat> financial niches. It was called uh, Your Money or Your Life was kind of what Google labeled all of those. Um, but Google wants to understand not just the quality of the content, but the quality of the people creating the content. Basically, are you authorized? Do you have the, the uh, you know, trust necessarily to create that, that piece of content? So the, the buckets they look at are experience. Um, we can see here a summary here. That's how, experience, how much experience the content creator has in the real world life. That's new. Uh, authoritativeness. Um, are you the go-to source for the co content that you're writing about? Expertise. Um, do you have the necessary knowledge? 
credentials, et cetera. If you're writing out medical stuff, you know, are you a physician? Are you, you know, um, a registered nurse? You have some type of expertise that, that shows that you have are qualified to talk about this. And then trust, the extent to which the page is honest, accurate, safe, and reliable. You'll notice, I mean, these are somewhat subjective. Google has a whole guide called their Quality Raiders Guide where they talk about every different element of how they assess expertise, uh, experience, authoritativeness, and trust. But just know going into this, again, we'll mention some of these things as we get into it. Um, Google's really looking carefully, not at how help, only at how helpful your content is, but do you have the expertise and authority to be speaking into that content? All right. So let's go through, we're going to go through a five-step strategy if you want to rank your website. These are going to be, this is sort of the 80-20 of, of SEO. So this is 20% of things that you can do that will have um, really the first 80% of results. And then there's a whole bunch of other stuff you can do we're not going to get into. I just want to cover the core things that any business, small or large, can do to improve their search engine optimization. So first is strategy. Um, and the first part of strategy I recommend is get to know your SERP. So SERP is a SEO kind of nerdy term. It stands for search engine results page. Essentially, if you search for the different services you provide, whether it's roofing or accounting services, financial advisory services, et cetera, just go and search for that services, that service, you're going to get a search engine results page that could look like this. Or if you're like an e-commerce store, it could look something like this. Or if you're a restaurant, it could look completely different. Um, one of the changes that Google's had over the last several years is that each search engine results page, it changes depending on the intent of the user. So user intent becomes a big, uh, big um, concept. Um, so one of the things, and actually that arrow's uh, pointed at the wrong place, but if you look, we'll just kind of talk through it. If you were looking for a local service business, at the very top, you'll have what they call local service ads. They're ads that stem from your Google business profile and they're, they pay you pay per lead. Um, the next we have search ads. We have Joyland right there um, and another roofing company. Um, the search ads, so PPC ads, you pay per click. Um, those are two types of ads. We're not gonna get into advertising for this call, but just know for local service businesses, you'll have those two types of, of ads. And then we get what we call the map pack. We will get into that in this conversation. Uh, your map pack is a list of um, Google business profiles. So if you go claim your Google your profile in business, which is free, we'll talk about that. Um, you have a chance to appear in this list of maps and um, stars and things like that at the top of the page. That is a different ranking algorithm. There's a different way in which you rank your Google business profile than your website. And then we get into directories. LancasterPA.com is, is an authoritative source. It appears in a lot of different directories. Um, Gordy, who owns that, does a lot, puts a lot of energy into SEO. So for here in Lancaster, um, you'll see a directory that's just listings and listings of different businesses. Then we have people also ask. So these are questions that Google is answering directly in the search results page. That's been a trend with Google of getting the information right in the search results page. People don't need to click as much. And then we get into local business sites. So we just, the reason this is important is if we want to rank, if we want to get people coming to our website from Google, we need to know what Google looks like when people you know, enter our services. So there are different strategies for ranking in different elements here. So we're going to talk about how to get your Google business profile ranking. We're going to talk about how to get your website ranking. Like we have Zimmerman's down there. Um, we'll talk about each of those sort of in order. Um, one quick tip, if you don't have time to listen to the rest of this presentation, uh, one quick tip to rank really well in SEO is just spend a good amount of time searching for the things you want to rank for, see what other people have done to rank well, and just try to do it better. That means find their content and try to write better content, more helpful content, authoritative content, et cetera. Look at their Google business profile, look at all the things they have in their Google business profile, to have a lot of reviews, they have this, and just try to do it better. Um, there's, you know, we're going to get into more detail than that, but that's kind of a quick rule of thumb for SEO. For e-commerce hey, businesses, oh, sure, yep. Um, so somebody asked how or where they can find their SERP, like where do they go to find it? Yeah. So, so what I mean by this is literally it's, it's as simple as searching for this, like open up google.com and search for the things you want to rank for. So if you're a pizza shop, search like pizza shop near me and see what comes up. Uh, if you sell, you know, your cultural products, like here we've got pig feeders, if you sell pig feeders, search pig feeders, you know, that just, and we're going to talk about how to choose which keywords are going to be good for you actually right after this. Um, but essentially the search engine results page, what I mean by that is just the page people see when they search for the services or products that you provide. So that's that's how you get that SERP up there. Um, there is something called a branded SERP or branded search engine results page. That's what comes up when someone searches your name. Um, we're actually not going to get into that too much, but it is valuable too, just to know what, when someone searches the name of your business, what comes up. And then to do that, you just go to google.com, search the name of your business and see what pops up. But in this case, we're talking more about the services and products you provide. Um, so yeah, so if you are selling products, you'll see it looks a lot different. There are a lot of images. Um, so if we, you search agriculture, agricultural products, um, first we get like a manufacturer's website. So in this case, a website does come up first. Um, then we get some image results. 
So this is why you might hear people talk about optimizing your images using good like alt tags and things like that. In your website provider, you can usually go and just put a name behind each of your images. One of the advantages of that is if you have the type of search engine result where images appear really high up, by naming those images in your website tool, you have a chance to come up here. Then national e-commerce, so get like Amazons and things like that. Then we have Google Shopping, which is again, kind of out of the purview of this, but it is worth knowing there's a tool called Google Merchant Center. And if you're selling products online, you should definitely have your products um, in Google Merchant Center. Because you can see here, like I said, Google's trying to skip the website a little bit. Google will take the websites that are on your, this, the products that are on your website and push them right into the search engine results page through their tool called Google Merchant Center. It's free. There isn't, you can pay to promote them more heavily, but you can list your products for free and they'll come up in places like this. And then people also ask, we said, it'll have a list of questions that appear there. So those are two different options, but the, the takeaway from this should be search for some of the things you'd want to come up for and just get a deep understanding of what's there so you know kind of what you're optimizing for. The next step is we're going to try to pick what types of questions or what types of things we should be talking about on our website. So the general marketing funnel, you might hear like attention, interest, desire, action, or something like this, find you, trust you, buy from you. Uh, from an SEO context, I really like this one. It's essentially outlining the buyer's journey. If someone doesn't know about you, first, they've got to find you on search engine results pages. Um, and we don't create some content that's going to help them find you. Next, we need to trust you. So when they land on that website, we need them to actually trust that you can deliver what they have to, uh, you know, uh, deliver the services at the level they expect, and then buy from you. Ultimately, you want them to set up a free consultation or purchase a product or do whatever the necessary steps are that they actually make a purchase. And it's good to find keywords at every level of this question. So let's say you're a patio installer <clears throat> or a landscape designer. We're going to go to Google and we'll type in patio installation. So again, we're, we're letting Google dictate how we should rank with Google, which is a helpful process. Um, you know, when an SEO firm works with you, one of the first things they'll do is SEO research. So they'll use a lot of complex, expensive tools to determine exactly which keywords rank. And they are helpful, but you can get about 80% of the way there just by using Google as its own tool. So again, in this example, we would search patio installation. And the first thing that comes up is what we call Google auto suggest. So a whole bunch of things pop up. Patio installation near Mountville, patio installation near uh, Lancaster, near me, patio installation cost, paver patio installation, how to install paver patios, uh, paver patios, how to install them on dirt, and paver, paver patio base. So what Google's essentially told us here is if I'm, in, if I'm selling pay, patio installations, these are the types of things people ask. So at the very beginning, we want to come up with a list of terms, a list of things that we want to rank for in Google. And then one of the ways we can do that is just by searching the basic service you provide. And now Google's already told you, we should probably also go after the term patio installation near me or near Lancaster PA. So that might be the title of a page or something, which we'll talk about in a minute. We should also probably cover cost. How much does it cost? That comes up a lot. And then paver patios. People add the word paver, so we should probably have some content around paver patios. Next, after you've seen that part of Google, staying on that same Google page, we're going to scroll down a little bit, and we get to people also ask. So these are the specific questions people see people typing into Google, and Google will benefit you by create by going after these types of terms too. So <clears throat> how do I estimate a patio? How much should I budget for a patio? Is it cheaper to pave, to have a paver or concrete patio? Um, and do patios add value to your home? So these are all things. So again, I mean, we're going to take a bunch of keywords. You can put them in a you know Word doc or just somewhere we're collecting. Here are all the things we should rank for because we know people are searching for those terms. These are all. These are some great ones. So we have cost is still a factor. Um, we could cover you know um, how much should I budget for a patio? Might be a term we're going to run after. Um, paver patios versus concrete patios. Another great term to, to be going after if you're a patio company. And do patios add value to your home? Another really solid term. Google's basically told you people are looking for these pieces of information. So Google will reward you if you go after those terms. And then on the same search results page, we'll have the bottom related searches. So Google's going to show us um, people also search patio companies. So someone should probably mention patio companies, best patio builders near me. So you might want a piece of co a content that runs after best patio builder near me. Um, Google's giving us a whole other like six things. So Truly, if I were you know an SEO service provider and I'm working with a patio uh, and I'm working with a patio client, um, I would know you know right off the bat here we have like a great like you know eight to twelve pieces of content, eight to twelve terms we should really run after. We know um, we'll cover how to rank for those terms as we get into this, but we know right out of the gate in our strategy section we should really be going after um, all of those those eight to twelve terms we kind of mentioned through there. We really want to rank for them, and now we just need to figure out how to rank for them. Um, 
So we might out of the gate say, here's our strategy. You know, for the first 60 days, 90 days, we're going to run after some awareness terms like backyard patio ideas. Um, you see like ideas comes up a lot at the very beginning of the buyer's journey. If you're a landscape design company, um, when I'm just thinking about, do I want a patio? I might search ideas, inspiration, those types of things. Patio costs, <clears throat> as I kind of move to the next level, I'm going to try to figure out how much should I budget for this project. So I should probably try to rank my website for different patio cost type terms. And then I want, if someone is at the bottom of the funnel, if they're ready to buy it from me, they're ready to hire me, something like patio company in Lancaster PA, which would again cover like patio company near me, patio companies, et cetera. I should probably run after the term patio company in Lancaster PA. So that kind of gives us the strategy at the beginning. So we start, we sit down, you know, don't just type one. If you're a pizza shop, type pizza shop near me, sub shop near me, great lunch spots near me, best places for lunch in Lancaster. Like just kind of brainstorm, think the things people might search, type them into Google. And then once you've thought through what people might search, Google will tell you what people are actually searching. So without paying a dime, you have a, a very solid SEO strategy right there. If you did want to go a little more robust, there's actually a free tool that you can use a bit of. If you want to see exactly how many times someone searches patio company in Lancaster, patio, which is a patio cost in Lancaster, um, I have the link here. We're going to send out the presentation. You can just use that link. Ahrefs is a tool I use. It's like $200 a month, but they have a free tool you can kind of play around with for a little bit at ahrefs.com front slash keyword generator. And once you kind of did the process that I just talked about, if you want to go even deeper, you could type some of those keywords in here and Ahrefs will tell you exactly how many times those terms are searched. All right. The well, last thing I'll say, I want to talk a word, I'll give you a word about AI before we get out of the strategy section. So, I mean, we've probably, we've, I mean, we're probably tired now of hearing about chat GPT and different AI tools. Um, and it's probably going to keep, keep happening. Um, in the world of SEO, <clears throat> AI is really good for some things and really bad for other things. So as we're sitting down, we're trying to strategize how we're going to approach SEO, how we get our website ranking for the terms we want to rank for to grow our traffic. Um, it can be really good for coming up with clickworthy titles. And this is actually from Ahrefs, that tool I just mentioned. They put out this, this helpful guide. I meant to put their logo there. Anyway, um, so if you know I want to rank for um, patio costs, you could put the, that in a chat GPT and tell them, give me like 20 titles or like 10 titles that address the topic of, of patio cost. And they'll give you a bunch of ideas. How much should a patio cost? You know, how much should I budget for a patio, et cetera. It's great for that because I know the keyword I want to rank for, but I just, if I'm not feeling as creative that day, I might not know exactly how I want to label my title. Um, it's also good for uh, coming up with article outlines or even landing page outlines. So I'll use it for this very often. So if I'm going to write an article about how much to budget for a patio, I might say chat GPT, you know, uh, give me a, an outline for a, um, for a patio. It's great for that. It's a free, you know, the free version will give you a great outline. You don't have to pay anything. It actually outline your whole post. Also, in the world of AI tools, it can be great for proofreading, kind of switching gears a little bit. There's a tool Grammarly out there, which also has a free uh, version, which is really good at like analyzing sentence structure and things like that, that after you've written your post, it can, you know, keep you from publishing um, grammar errors and things like that. So those are three really good uses for AI that can make your process a lot more streamlined, right? <clears throat> you know your blog, it can give you a good title or a couple of good titles you can choose from. It can give you some great outlines and it can be great for uh, proofreading. On the negative side, what I've <clears throat> I've had like five clients email me the last two months be like, hey, I'm just I knocked out like 20 blog posts with uh, Chat GPT, and that's okay, um, but it is likely to uh, to harm um, your your SEO presence overall. Again, we talked about the helpful content update a little bit ago that Google has. There are a couple problems with if you just say you know, chat GPT, like write a 2000 word article about patio installation. Uh, the first is that Google is checking, is likely checking for AI. Um, and Google's going back and forth a little bit, but overall it can have a negative score on how helpful your content is. Secondarily, if, if you type in patio installation, you know, how much does the patio installation cost in Lancaster? And you type in how much does the patio installation cost in Phoenix, Arizona with chat GPT, even with chat GPT four, like the newest version, I, I've tested this a good bit you tend to get the exact same blog post with just a couple words swapped out. One of the things for years that Google will penalize very heavily is duplicate content. So if all of your competitors are like, hey, we're just gonna use ChatGPT and they all just type the same, blog, essentially the same blog post articles into ChatGPT, even if you play with the title and the inputs and stuff, you're getting very much the same type of blog post. So you're gonna see a whole bunch of businesses that all have, with some minor changes, the exact same blog post. Um, you get a lot of duplicate content out there. So. Um, I would stay away from that. And I honestly think as more companies are turning to it, unless the tool gets a lot better in the next two or three years, um, we've got a good chance to actually rank better 
uh, by creating our own authentic original content. I think this rush to AI is going to help the companies that are sticking true to creating good, helpful content. Um, so creating long form content I actually did this out of order. Creating long form content is, is something we don't want to do a lot of with AI. Um, the second thing is AI driven keyword research. I've seen some people that say, hey, I'll just tell chat GPT, like run, tell me 20 keywords that have to do with, um, you know, with uh, patios, patio installation. And it'll give you a list, but it's not at all grounded in how many people search for those terms. You're way better off just doing the process we just talked about. Let Google tell you which ones are the most popular um, or, or a tool like Ahrefs tell you which ones are the most popular and run after strategic keywords. Don't just let it generate a list for you or something like that. So, so both of those can have negative ramifications for your search engine results. All right, so, uh, so step number one, that's the, that's the strategy side of things. Uh, the second step we're gonna go into is optimizing our website. Um, so there's something that Google came out with called Core Web Vitals. I recommend not getting too worked up about this, uh, and I'll mention it in a minute, but it is worth knowing how fast your website is, essentially. So Google, last July, uh, July of 22, I think, said so they're going to start ranking websites based on how it's first contentful paint, which is basically how quickly you see the first thing, um, largest contentful paint, which is how long does it take the whole web page to load, and then time to um, inter interactive. So how quickly can I start clicking on things, basically? Uh, there's a free tool called pagespeed.web.dev, which belongs to Google. And you can go in here and see where your website ranks. You can see mine's like a 66. It's not, not 100 by any stretch. Um, in Generally speaking, if your website is incredibly slow, if you get like a 10 on the score, that could be problematic. It's a, you know, that might mean that you're a lot slower than your competitors and things, which could be a problem. If you're like anywhere from like a 50 to a 70, likely in your small local business, you don't need to worry about it too, too much. Um, it is good to be aware of it, but even John Mueller, who's and we'll talk about later, who's Google's like um, main uh, authority, kind of the public relations authority for what to focus on and not focus on Google, has said most local businesses shouldn't get too wrapped up about this. So it's important to know about it. Like I said, if you were to use this free tool and you see that you're like a 10, like everything's bright red, it's taking 10 minutes to load, or 10 seconds to load your website, that could be a problem. If you're like right in the middle of the pack, you're probably good to go. Just something to be aware of. The next thing is structured data. If your website is on WordPress or um, or uh, Shopify, excuse me, there's a tool called Yoast. Um, it's free for WordPress. It's, there is a, a small fee on uh, on Shopify, um, but it basically structured data um, takes the information you have on your website and it tells Google what to do with that information. So it's going to say, "This is a product. This is the title of the product." Excuse me. And this is how much the product costs. Or on your blog article, say, "This is a blog article. It's generally about." patio installation, the title is this, et cetera. It makes it much easier for Google to understand who your business is, what types of content you have, and even what products and services you have. Um, again, it's a free tool in WordPress, small fee on Yoast, I'm uh, oh, sorry, small fee on Shopify. Um, and it'll just help you really optimize your website for search tools. There are other great tools out there. There's one called Rank Math. It's just for WordPress. But I mentioned Yoast just because it works both on WordPress and Shopify, which should cover probably 90% of the people that are on this call. So um, if you have a website, um, you know, check with your web designer, try to get this tool on there, and that can help you get more structured data on the website. So first, is the website loading quickly? Is something you want to check? Again, just to make sure you're at least in the middle of the pack. Second, make sure you have some tool on there that's taking the information to your website and putting it in a structured way that Google can read. Um, and, and that's, you know, re really easy, just kind of checklist, make sure it gets done. Third thing I'm going to talk about is what actual pages to put on the website. So, um, I'm actually going to reverse order, but you have a slide. I'm not sure why I put it in this order. <laughs> um, first, on the home page, there are a couple. Uh, the first page we talk about is your home page, and there are a couple of things I see that are missing from a lot of so uh, local search businesses. It actually help their SEO a lot. Um, one on your home page, you have a strong positioning statement at the top, so tell Google what you do right at the beginning. Um, next, there, you know, talk about the customer's problem. So things they might search. You know, if I'm a financial advisor, maybe um, you know how to make sure you have more money for retirement or are your finances a mess or so, something like that? Like talk about the things people are likely to be searching for for Google and make sure your website um, <clears throat> specifically addresses the core problems you face. Um, video we'll talk about in a bit, but it'd be great to have a type of something like a video in there. Um, have something about your business and what your business does and some of your authority statements. Again, that can speak to EEAT, -E um, your authority, expertise, those types of things. And it just helps reinforce the client that you're the qualified source to go there. I'd say you're a trusted bank or you're a trusted, you know, um, you know, uh, agricultural manufacturing company, et cetera. Just have some statements why the customer can trust you, why proxy, why Google can trust you. Next, have a list of your services or of your e-commerce, a list of your product categories. So the things you sell, you know, we sell 
arts and crafts. We sell this with a little, a couple sentences about it. Like if you're a uh, lawn care company, you know, we offer lawn, you know, landscape design, we offer landscape maintenance, et cetera. And a couple words about it. Right on your homepage, you should have all of the core services or all the core product categories you provide. Your homepage is the first page Google's going to index, and they're going to take that as your statement about what's important to you. So it's really important that you have your test, your um, services or product categories listed there. Next are testimonials. Google loves reviews, so get some references there. And then service-related FAQs. We talked a lot about people also ask as a tool for knowing what people are asking Google. One of the other options is you might want to get into the people also ask, right? That will show your answers to questions, which is always good, and a link to your website. Those are all drawn from FAQs on people's websites, mostly drawn from FAQs on people's websites. So I recommend having a frequently asked questions section, potentially on your homepage, definitely on every service page. Then uh, next thing, again, this is often missing where I'll see um, for some local service businesses, they have like our services as one page. And if they're like a carpenter, they'd say like, you know, we do millwork and we do, you know, uh, framing, et cetera, et cetera. You should really have a page for every core service that you want to rank for. If you want to rank as a patio installer or as a kitchen remodeling company, you should have a page dedicated to patio installation or kitchen remodel. Um, or if you're a pizza shop, you should have a page just about, you know, um, how to find the best pizza shop in Lancaster. Some core things at the very top, list the service, like just to say pizza shop, Lancaster PA, or you know, kitchen remodeling company in Lancaster, PA. Keep it very simple so Google can understand and people can understand. Then list some things about your service. What is your approach to um, landscape design or millwork? Uh, next thing, have your service process. So what are the steps you take to help people? You know, we come out to your property, we assess your property, and then we give you a 3D rendering or, or whatever it might be. Let people know the process of what it's like to work with you. And then get into some topical details. If you're a remodeling company, talk about the different material, materials you might use or those kind of things. These are all things that are going to help Google understand what you do and build that expertise, authority, and trust. Next, have a good about page. I'm mixing things up a little bit. This is Foggy Ridge, um, a group called Improve and Grow does their SEO. Uh, they're a great uh, company. But their about page has a great understanding of who they are, You know what makes this company different, those kind of things. And then it talks about what they do. So the services and their unique um, elements for those services and then what they stand for. So they've got some of their core values there and they have a core, um, a core um, call to action. The reason this is really important is that Google needs to understand who your business is and what makes you an expert, what makes you especially skilled at what you provide. So whether you're a huge financial institution all the way down to like a single person handyman, having an about page is what Google's going to look at in order to understand, going back to EAT, do you have the expertise, authority, trust, and experience um, to, to be the company that ranks for the service you want to provide? So those three pages are like the three must have. Again, we're talking about the 80-20 here. So just make sure your website has a good homepage with each of these elements. Make sure you've got a good about page that talks all about your company, what you stand for, and then make sure each service or product category that you want to rank for has its very own page with all of these items. The last thing I'd say here, don't go light on these pages. Um, this is a quick, uh, there's a cool tool called Surfer SEO, and you can run it for any term you'd want to rank for. In this case, I looked at roofing company like Mr. PA, and it'll do this analysis. What it's looking at is how many words do the top ranking pages on Google have? And they, they almost all look like this. If you want to look rank for a roofing company like Sir Pierre, the first page results is saying positions one to 10. That's the first column. There are essentially 10 websites on the first page of Google. So the, first, the sites that are on the first page of Google have on average 1,800 words. The sites on page two of Google have on average 1,200 words. Then it bumps up a little bit to 600, um, to 1,600, excuse me. The, the sites on page three of Google have on average around 600 words and then 400 words for the ones on page four. You can see there's a one-to-one -one correlation to how much content you have on your landing pages and whether or not you rank on the first page of Google. So if you want to rank better on Google, not only do we need very helpful content, but we need a good bit of content. So you probably want to, uh, depending on how competitive your niche, niche is, a lot of your landing pages should probably be 1,000 to 2,000 words. Now do it in a strategic way. Don't make, make like a 2,000 word Word doc appear on your site. Make it look something like this, like beautiful and well-designed but you're going to need a healthy amount of content these days if you want to outrank your competitors on each individual page. All right. Once we've had our website performing well, we've got structured data, we've got our core landing pages. The next thing we going to do is create really good, helpful content, like ongoing, have a process of ongoing content creation on the website. So one of the core things that drives this, in addition to helpful content, which we talked about, is good internal linking. So John Mueller, who's the main guy that tells us what Google wants to see, said in a recent um, uh, webinar, internal linking is super critical for SEO because that's one of the biggest things you can do on a website to kind of guide Google and guide visitors to the pages you think are important. So we want good internal links. What I mean by internal links are 
on if you write a blog post about how much it costs to do a patio installation and on that blog post, you use the word patio company in Lancaster PA. Like if you're looking for a good patio company in Lancaster PA, you should highlight that text in the blog post and link it over to your service page. What that's going to build is a nice hub and spoke model with Google. So, uh, so the people that have this kind of site structure, uh, the, the businesses that have it rank significantly better than people who don't. So our core service page, um, just using because we're sticking with patio installation today, let's say we have a service page that is you know, titled patio installer or patio installation company in Lancaster, PA. That's like a 1500 word you know, page just all about patio installation and our approach to patio installation. Now, we're going to want to either create some videos or some blog posts that answer some basic questions. How much does installation cost? How do I choose a patio installer? Mistakes to avoid with patio installation. Common myths about patio installation. How patio installation is different in Lancaster. We have you know, a wide range of temperatures than other areas. So how patio installation in Lancaster is different. Those will be fantastic articles or videos to create about the topic of patio installation. You can also apply that to almost any service that you provide. But in each of those blog posts, you want to have a little link that goes back to your core service page. So if you have a lot of really good blog posts and they all have links, internal links, <laughs> excuse me, that go back to your core service page, you're going to get this hub and spoke model and you're going to tell Google essentially, we are the author most authoritative source on patio installation or whatever you're providing. We're the most authoritative pizza shop. You know, um, you know, you could write, so if you're a pizza shop, right, your core service page is pizza shop in Lancaster PA. That might even be your homepage. It's just pizza shop in Lancaster PA. Maybe you write about keto pizza or cauliflower pizza or like, um, you know, uh, the best, you know, Friday night option for pizza. You'd want to use some strategy there, but you can have a whole bunch of different things about, you know, that and just create that topic and that, that cluster there. All right. All right. I have so a question, Adam, those? in the chat. Oh, yeah. Yep. So um, somebody asked, how would content and about and service pages be different for a nonprofit as compared to a for-profit? Oh, yeah. I've just done like three nonprofits lately. I worked with them, like create some strategies for them. Um, it is essentially the same. The one thing with nonprofits you've got to kind of juggle is like you have two audiences, right? You've got your clients. Uh, for a lot of nonprofits, you have clients that you might be serving um, or events that you're running, whatever. Um, and then you also have donors to work through. Um, with a nonprofit, you really want to think through, um, you know, what you want to rank for. So if you're Water Street, um, you know, who's someone you talk to about, um, I, I meet with monthly about SEO and stuff, like they they really um, want to let people know that we rank for like medical clinic. Um, they want to rank for, um, you, know, you know, free medical clinic, dental clinic, um, shelter, homeless shelter, etc. So um, the ideal would be, and there's some brand things we got to figure out. But the ideal from an SEO standpoint would be, let's get medical clinic, dental clinic, et cetera, on here. If you're an arts and entertainment, you know, let's go to a different venue. If you're a nonprofit who does a lot of arts and entertainment events, your homepage should say, you know, we provide, you know, um, yeah, concerts. We provide, I mean, you'll make it sound better. But, you know, we provide concerts. We provide educational lectures from, you know, a series of artists. And we have a rotating gallery gallery series. Like, so you can rank for like art gallery, like Sir PA, concerts in like Sir PA, et cetera. Like just kind of at a high level on your homepage, you know, kind of dictate what you do. On your about page, you just want to have a lot of stuff about your mission, your cause, like what makes you different? What is your approach to arts entertainment or serving the homeless you know, community or whatever your nonprofit does? It's kind of the same concept, but this is where you can really explain how your nonprofit um, is the most trusted, reliable source for the thing you do. And then your service page, which is aligned with the services that you provide, assuming you have services. Uh, I mean, if you're a chamber of commerce, like we might have just something about events in Lancaster. If you're an arts and entertainment, we might have a concert series in Lancaster or, you know, an artist, you know, artist services here. Or if you're a water street rescue mission, we obviously want to have a really good page about, um, you know, about a medical, you know, free dental clinic or free medical clinic and, um, you know, shelter, those types of things. So it changes a little, a little bit, but I mean, that's the, the, still the core is like, what do you, what do you do? What are you offering in the community? What makes you different? And then what, you know, how that helps as far as donor. I mean, I don't want to be too dismissive, but I haven't seen search engine optimization as a strong fundraising opportunity in that, like people just don't search, like who can I give money to, or who can I support? But if they care very deeply about golden retrievers, they might search what nonprofit helps golden retrievers. Or if they care very deeply about helping the homeless population, they might search who's, you know, a local homeless shelter near me, those types of things. And at that, at that level, then the, the approach is still the same. You're going to say, this is how we serve and those kind of things. And, and you'll still be able to reach donors in that way. So I'd really focus on whatever the, I know there's nonprofits, you know, go much beyond arts and entertainment and homeless, et cetera, but that's the overall view there. 
So we have a little bit. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yep. We have a second question. Um, So somebody asked, do you recommend different websites for the same company if the location and services are different? Yeah, almost, almost never. Um, There is a uh, domain authority is a score that gets thrown around a lot or or, um, domain rank, like, which just means it is the score your website has in the eyes of Google. So it's kind of like a credit score. Um, And there are a lot of factors there. How many authoritative authoritative websites link back to your website is a core one. Um, How much content is on the website? Helpful content. How do people engage with the content? Those kind of things. And it is sort of the tide that rises all ships is what you hear a lot of SEOs say. So as your website grows in authority, it helps the whole website. Um, So generally speaking, you would want even like large, large companies with a lot of extensions in when we're talking about SEO specifically, we just want one site. When you get into microsites and stuff, that can be good for like paid ad campaigns and things. But for SEO, pretty much keep it to one site. I didn't mention location pages, um, but but if you have um, multiple locations, you would just want to have really, really good location pages. There's an accounting firm that I, I coach and they've got like six or seven locations now through like Harrisburg and Lancaster. Um, and the, the, what we're really working towards is getting a really good accountant in Harrisburg PA page, like accounting services in Harrisburg PA page. I talked about bookkeeping services and financial consulting, all those kind of things. So each location you're in should have its own page. Um, and one thing I'll also throw out there, you also want a different Google business profile location for each one. So uh, we'll talk about Google business profile in a, bit, in a minute, I don't, but just to answer the question specifically, each one has a page. And then when you go to business.google.com, you're going to claim a location. So you'd have accounting firm X, you know, Harrisburg office, Lancaster office, et cetera. And then each of those listings should link back to the appropriate location page. So kind of three steps. We've got a, a different page for every location we have. We have a different Google My Business location for every, a bit, Google My Business listing for every location we have, which can, and then each of those will link back to the location page. Um, but no, I would not recommend local businesses unless you offer like, you know, virtual reality lounge, and you also offer, um, you know, web design, like, you know, the causes, um, like if you have those two like extremes, then you want to like branch into two things. Otherwise, um, you're going to want to just keep it probably as one, one man website. Any other questions? None right now. So you're good. cool. All right. So we'll keep rolling. So we got this, this hub and spoke model we're talking about here. So we want to create at least once a month, I'd recommend a really helpful piece of content. Um, that could mean you sit down and you write blog posts and that would be totally fine. Um, I do recommend that people consider creating videos. And this is a process, I'm actually, I'm putting it up here. I'm actually gonna circle back around to the process, but I'd recommend you create videos and then turn those videos into blog posts. And the reason being, if you have videos and blog posts, um, and this is from Orbit Media, who's another great resource in SEO. Um, if you've got both out there, you essentially have two ways to bring people into your website. Your video itself, so if you did a video on how much a patio installation cost, that patio installation video could actually appear right on the first page of Google for patio installation costs. Google loves video. I mean, they own YouTube. Um, Also, if you embed that video on on a blog post, that blog post could rank right at the top of Google. So if you create both, uh, you essentially have two ways to rank. And then the two, we mentioned that linking is really important, like that back to that model here. You you could have the video and the blog post could essentially be two different spokes in your content hub and spoke model. So... While home, getting on the search results page, just having the article is okay, it's way better if you have both out there. So, but again, it's not like it's a deal killer. If you can't do video, that's fine, but I would recommend having a video and a blog post. So I want to go through a really quick thing that most of my clients are using that's really getting them to rank a lot better um, by creating a combination of video and blog posts. And this ranges from like, one's like a $12 million business all the way down to um, uh, like a 500,000 a year business. Um, so you don't need to be, you know, a uh, huge business or, or it, and it can also work on larger size businesses. I think you can work more than that size business. It just happens to be the range that I tend to work with. All right. So if you're going to create video, number one, I recommend using a simple s- setup. So you, something like this, if you go to Best Buy, you can buy like a really inexpensive microphone and an inexpensive tripod. And you can connect them both to your phone and have a simple setup there. Just the key here is like stop by Best Buy. Two things you might want to invest in would be a cheap tripod just to camera's not moving and an inexpensive microphone, which will even an inexpensive microphone will work better than your cell phone's core, core device. So, or even if you just put it on a tripod and you don't buy a microphone and you're, as long as the phone's close to you, you could kind of make that work, but don't go crazy on, on, you know, buying things. The only two things I'd ever recommend are a tripod and a microphone if you want to do that, uh, but keep it kind of simple. Um, the next thing, when you actually go to shoot a video, try to use diffused natural light. So you can't really see if that's kind of what I have in here. I've got a window right here and a window right there. Um, you know, like this is not me, this is a YouTube video, but that's um, obviously, but um, 
you know, the, the idea here is that you'd have light coming in at a 45 degree angle and it wouldn't be direct sunlight. So if the sun's coming right in, in there, you don't want that. You want the, the sun kind of just ambient light kind of coming in at a 45 degree angle. I recommend using uh, natural light. What I mean by this is if you can do this without a ring light, ring lights can create weird features and things. If you're trying to create a very professional looking video without investing too much in a lot of equipment and things, um, using this lighting setup will make your videos look much, much better. So 45 degree angle and just not like direct sunlight um, are the two kind of keys there. So diffuse meaning not direct, natural light meaning we're using sunlight. Next, understand a little bit about sound science. This room is actually not great for this, but the way sound works is that when it when the um, sound leaves your mouth, it's going to come and hit the microphone on my computer. That's going to bounce off the wall and hit it like a microsecond later. So it creates a weird like echoey effect. It's called reverb. It's not actually an echo, but it's called reverb and it creates an echo-like effect on your audio. That can make it sound a little unprofessional if you're releasing these videos. So if I were recording for a YouTube video, I would just put something behind it. So if you're in a room that has a lot of soft surfaces, like a living room, you don't need to worry about that. If you're recording in a, a small room like I'm in right now, um, even just putting a couple pillows or something, you know, or some blankets behind uh, the camera and behind the microphone will catch those sound and actually make your video sound far more professional. So, so you can create some really nice looking and sounding videos by just using simple equipment, some natural light, and then just understanding some sound science to make the sound quality really good. Um, then you just want to do a little bit of editing on the video by doing like even like 15 minutes of editing, your video is going to look a lot more professional. There's a tool called Premiere Rush. It is a paid tool. It's $10 a month. Or if you are on the Apple ecosystem, there's a tool called iMovie that works on Mac computers and on iPhones that are quite easy. And you can actually edit the videos right on your phone if you want to edit these. Basically, this is uh, Premiere Rush, but iMovie looks almost the same. Once you've recorded your movie, your video, um, you just open it in one of those tools. You'll get to select the video you just shot. And then in the tool, you can actually slice and trim and edit. So you can take out some ums and uhs. You can take out the beginning of the video, the end of the video, which is kind of cut down to when you actually start talking, assuming you like went and fiddled with the camera to get it looking right. Um, yeah, so you can cut it down to a very professional looking video that's kind of cleaned up. And again, in 15 minutes, you can kind of just slide back and forth and chop it up a little bit. Um, you can also have graphics. So you can pull a logo into your video. You can have your name kind of come into the bottom of the video with both iMovie and Premiere Rush. You can make that happen really quickly. And then right from both those tools, you can publish right to YouTube. So I actually do like an hour long uh, workshop um, very often that we cover all of this. So that's like the, the five minute version, it's just the, the highlights of all of that. But if you are thinking that you wanna create some videos and blog posts, um, again, you can make it look really professional by just be, you know having a small amount of equipment that you pick up at Target, Best Buy, Walmart. Um, just be cognizant of your light, try to get some good quality light. Be cognizant of your sound and maybe try to get some soft, items in there, and then just do a little bit of editing. And that will create some very nice informational type videos that'll let us uh, follow through this process. So step one is just go through, create that video. Step two would be to get a transcript of the video. So if, let's go back to patio installation. We just made a video. So you're a patio installer, you are out in the field or whatever, and you just made a video. Here's how to get, here's how to save some money on a patio installation. So we just did that video. Next, we're gonna wanna transcribe that video. A five minute video, um, leads to about uh, 800 words of content. So you actually, in doing that quick five minute video and spending 15 minutes editing it, um, we now have a great video to put out there, but we also have an 800 word blog post to put out there. Um, and then post the video to YouTube. Um, there's a free tool called Canva, the, the logo's down here and the, the website's there too, um, where you can actually, if you wanna put a, get a thumbnail for your YouTube video, you can go to canva.com, it's free, type in YouTube thumbnails and they'll have templates there. You can actually just drag and drop some images and make a really quick one. Um, and then you're going to want to take the video itself. So this is Susquehanna Insurance. They've been doing this for a while. It's working really well. Take the video and those words and just post it as a blog post. Then once you've done all that, we have this. We have um, a video and an article, both that can rank in Google. And we also are building a pillar cluster because both of those link back to our service page. So now we have a solid resource and we've kind of taken our first step in building one of the spokes to rank for whatever service we might provide. Again, you don't have to do this. You can just write, write blog posts and that'll be fine. But one of the more aggressive things you could do is just take a, you know, a, a bit of time every month and take some time to record a video and you'll get, you'll be able to kind of leapfrog your competition definitely in, in some very competitive niches. All right. Adam, someone okay. asked if you recommend, I'm assuming this is a software or a program called CapCut. They said they use that in their organization, but is that one that you recommend? Um, I haven't heard that specific one, but, but yeah, I mean, there, there are, 
as long as you can do the, the fundamentals of like chopping and splicing things, you're good to go. I mean, there's Premiere Rush, there's DaVinci Resolve. And in the, actually in the hour long workshop, we kind of get into different softwares and why you may or may not want different ones. But yeah, CapCut, you know, I'm sure it's, it's great. I really, at this day and age, very few, you could, there like, there are probably 30 or 40 great ones out there that you can use. So if you're comfortable with it and you've been using it for a while, use the one you like, that's totally cool. Um, but the core thing is here, going back to the beginning, get a strategy where you get some good informational topics, like see what Google tells you you should rank for, make some videos about that, um, either write those out or transcribe those videos and get them out there as blog posts. As long as you're doing that, the software doesn't matter so much. So if you, if you like that one, that's, yeah, I have no reason not to use that one. All right, the next thing here, building trust outside of the website. So everything we talked to you to date is things you can do on your website. There are two things we can talk about really quickly before we get to question times. Um, that you can do on off your website. So one is just collect reviews. So what, a great way to collect reviews is after you work with a client, whether they came into your store, they came into your restaurant, if you're able to collect email addresses, after they come to the store, come to the restaurant, or if you just went out there and you installed a patio, <laughs> whatever service you provide, um, just email the client, um, uh, so, you know, collect their email address, make sure you get their email address, if at all you can. The next step is to actually give them a printed card. So we've seen a lot of success with this. We'll just print business cards that say, we really are thankful for your business and we would love to hear your feedback. And it either has a QR code or a link to leave you reviews. And if you hand that card out physically, a lot of times in person, people say, oh yeah, I'd love to leave them a review. So they make a mental note they want to leave the review. Then nine times out of 10, they'll forget. Um, and because they're going to forget, you won't get the review otherwise, it's good to then take that email address you collected and email them a week later and just say, would you mind leaving a review for us? Uh, there's a local retail shop I just uh, started working with like two months ago, doing some coaching for them. They just started doing this, this <clears throat> simple process and they're getting like 12 reviews a week. Um, reviews matter a whole lot in where you rank in Google. If you can get a steady stream of reviews, your ranking is very likely to go up, um, almost guaranteed to go up. Um, this is a simple process you can do. One quick note here, I'm seeing work for more clients is if you have employees, is actually having the employees give a, give a prize every month for whoever gets the most reviews. And, and the employees a lot of times will just tell customers, hey, we have a little contest. If you leave some feedback about me and mention my name, um, you know, hey, I talked to Adam, he was really helpful. Um, I get a little perk, so no pressure, but, but I'd really be thankful if you do that. Um, I've got a couple, like a handful of customers doing that. It's actually working even better. So they essentially do this process, but they just kind of incentivize their employees. That's another thing you can do. The one thing you cannot do is you can't incentivize customers. So you can never say, you know, we'll give you 50 bucks if you leave a good review. That's actually illegal. So don't, don't do that. But you can incentivize employees to get reviews. In the presentation, it's going to be emailed out. I have just two simple review requests. I tend to use one or two of these. Um, you can make it your own. But if you'd like to just, if you are uncomfortable writing an email that actually asks for the review, you can feel free to copy and paste one of these two if you'd like. The next thing is link building. So we want to get some links back to the website. I mentioned like periodicals, getting a good chamber listing is really good. Like getting, if you're joining the chamber and you get a link back, that's a great link. Some other ways to get uh, good links back to your website. One would be event PR. So if you're having an open house um, or you're going to have like a community day, or you're going to do a free info session. If you're a landscape designer, you're gonna do like a free design, con like a public kind of like design inspiration day or something like that. There's one I, I work with that part with a garden center. And they did like, you know, uh, they're going to cover the top 10 trends in gardening. So come for a free workshop, that kind of thing. <laughs> if you do a free event, any of those ideas or other ideas, um, you can reach out to all the local peer periodicals like RSVPA, WITF, WGAL. There are like 30 different places that have a free calendar. So if you just type events in Lancaster, you know, local community calendars in Lancaster, you'll see that list like 30 calendars. You can publish that event and then link all those back to your website. So that on the gate gets you like 20 or 30 links. Then you can write a quick press release. If you just Google how to write a good press release, you'll get lots of templates. You can take one of those templates and reach out to some local news sources, right? Reach out to WGL, reach out to, um, you know, Angle Publishing, et cetera. And just say, hey, we've got this free event coming up. We'd love if you mention it somewhere. In a lot of cases, um, if it, especially if it's a slow news week, um, they'll put that on the TV station. They'll put that on the newspaper, those kind of things, which will also get you a link back to your website. That's one. Another way to get a lot of really good links that I'm seeing with clients is podcast guesting. I should have put the link in here, but I didn't. There's a website called matchmaker.fm. Again, that is matchmaker.fm. And it's just got hundreds and hundreds of podcasts that are looking for guests. The nice thing about podcasts is if they've been out for a while, Google probably respects them. If you go as a guest on that show, they're likely to link back to your business. So if you own a business or if you're a leader in a business, if you're a you know chief marketing officer, a marketing director, uh, a nonprofit, whatever, there are lots of nonprofit you know. Um, Podcasts. There are lots of like entrepreneur podcasts. Um, there are marketing podcasts. I want to talk to CMOs and marketing directors. 
just go on there. If you just kind of um, find the podcast you're looking for hosts, that would be applicable to your, your space. And just say, hey, I'm a marketing director at a local nonprofit. I found, you know, that um, SEO has been really helpful for us. I'd love to share three quick, quick tips for SEO or fundraising or capital campaigns or whatever. Apply to your niche um, for free. You can typically get a lot of exposure and get a lot of links back to your website. Local directories are great. I have LancasterPA.com, but we should really all be on the Lancaster Chamber. So being on like chamber websites, um, websites like LancasterPA.com or Discover Lancaster are all great places. And then local nonprofit sponsorships. If you sponsor a Little, little League team, an arts and entertainment, um, if you pay for sponsorships, a lot of nonprofits will link back to you. Um, so this can be a way to actually get kind of give and take. You help the community, you get some links back. So those are four ideas. There are tons of ideas, but those are four that I'm probably saying are the easiest I mean, I would do all of them. If you pick one, think, oh, I could probably do that. Um, you can give it a shot. All right, last thing here, be sure to analyze your results. So there's a free tool called Google Search Console. If you go and just search for Google Search Console, it'll tell you where your website ranks for every term that Google can identify. So um, if you sign up for that, maybe work with your web designer to help implement it. It's very easy. It takes about a minute. Like you just go there and say, hey, this is my website. They will give you a little bit of code. Your web designer can then put that code on your website, run your domain excuse me and then once that's done you actually see where you rank and google will tell you as you're ebbing and flowing in the rankings it's free super helpful um it also tell you if there's a problem on your website if something's broken google will tell you um google analytics is another free tool hopefully you all have google analytics if you don't you know uh go to analytics.google.com it's a free tool again your web design it'll kind of same process you say this is my website it'll give you a bit of code your web designer can show you where you rank and then it can also show you engagement so the big things we want to track are if you do all the things or some, you know, even 80% of the things we just talked about, you should see in months, you know, three, four, five, six, that your rankings start to go up in search console, which then in months like four, seven, you know, the kind of the following months, your traffic is going to go up, which then they should lead to engagement and then good conversions, e-commerce sales, leads, et cetera. So I put together a 90 day checklist. This is the last slide. Um, it's in your, your slide. So these would be things, if you want to kind of break it down, I know it probably sounds like I give you like a million things to do, but if you could just do this months one, um, go to analytics and search console. Uh, next one there, um, go out there and like claim Google business profile, those kind of things. Send, start sending review requests month two. And by month two, also maybe create your first three videos and blog posts. Month three, submit some link pitches like we just talked about, either a podcast or an event, something like that. And then by also by month three, maybe by then you could have some service pages or product pages kind of build out. So honestly, if you just, if, if over the next three months, worked on two items per month, you'd be well on your way to a really solid SEO strategy. So that is, uh, there's my information there. And we don't have a ton of time for questions, but um, I'm happy to stick around afterwards. How does, Abby, does it cut off at like one? Yes. All right, never mind. So we'll talk in okay. minutes and email me if so you want. We do have a few questions. So two, somebody asked two questions specific about Google reviews. So they asked about employees leaving Google reviews themselves about the company. Yeah, recommend. Yeah, I wouldn't do it. Um, okay. Google actually says you should. I mean, Google could theoretically actually suspend you for doing it. Um, they'd have to catch you first, but um, <laughs> generally don't do it. Okay. And then they also asked, is it okay to offer an entry and a giveaway for reviews? So leave a review and be entered to win a cooler. Nope. That would still technically be, uh, that would actually be illegal. Uh, the F FTC is the, the governing body that has said any kind of incentives, including they actually specify giveaways early. Okay. And then somebody just asked if you could repeat the podcast matching website. Yep, it is matchmaker.fm. So matchmaker.fm. Uh, okay, I think I typed it correctly and I think I sent it to everyone. So hopefully everybody cool. has that. Um, if anyone has any other questions, feel free to drop it in the chat feature. Okay, somebody asked, what website services do you recommend paying for? Oh, um, do I recommend paying for? Um, I mean, there, there aren't a lot that come to mind. I'm sure if I thought more heavily about it, I could think of some. I feel like the beauty of being in 2023 is you can do almost anything for free. It's time or money, right? So almost anything that you get tired of doing, you can pay someone to do it. Um, I don't want to have to talk to the individual and kind of see what their business is. And yeah, I they feel like we don't have to be a small like a budget. Deeper. Small, yeah, if you're a small budget, do it for free. If you're like a pizza shop, maybe you want to pay for like DoorDash and stuff. If you're a home services company, there's a company called Bright Local. It just, it changes a lot. So I'd say try to do it on your own. But yeah, um, and I will say real quick before we cut off, I mean, I do, I mean, like, um, you know, I'd be happy to just talk. If you have questions, uh, like I'm not a salesy kind of person. So if you have a question, feel free to email me. I'd love to answer some specific questions. It, some of those would help if I just knew a little bit where you're coming from. I could recommend some tools. 
Yeah, of course. And Adam's information is here. If you lose it, whatever, you can reach out to the chamber. I have his contact information as well. Uh, if anyone has any other questions, feel free and throw them in the chat. In the chat. Um, so somebody said they would love to set up a time and chat with you with that same person. So yeah. his information on the screen, I recommend reaching out to him um, after the presentation. Um, if no one has any other questions, I'll wrap it up. Thank you, Adam. This was a really insightful presentation. Um, I loved learning about it. We always have good success with anything on marketing. Um, if there are other people echoing thank you in the chat. So Small Business Series does happen a couple of times a year. We have one coming up in April, all about strategy. So feel free and sign up for that. If you're interested, I'll send out a link in the follow-up email. I will also send out a copy of Adam's presentation as well as a copy of the recordings. You can view it afterwards. If there's anything you missed, you have all that information there. So thank you everyone. Thank you again, Adam. Have a great rest of your day.